Καλό. Ναι. Μπράβο. Καλό. Ένα, δύο. Perseus. And Oracle had informed King Acrisius of Argos that his grandson would deprive him of his throne and his life. Because of this he had his daughter Danae and Perseus, her child by Zeus, shut in a chest and cast into the sea. Through wave and wind Zeus guided the course of the chest, and the tide at last beached it on the island of Seraphis, over which two brothers ruled, Dictes and Polydectes. Dictes was fishing when the chest hove out of the water, and he dragged it ashore. Both he and his brother lavished affection on Danae and her child. Polydectes took her to wife and had Perseus, the son of Zeus, carefully reared. When he was fully grown, his stepfather urged him to go in search of adventure and undertake some quest that would bring him glory. The youth was willing enough, and soon they agreed that he was to find the Medusa, strike off her terrible head, and bring it to the king in Seraphis. Perseus set out on his quest, and the gods guided him to a far-off region where Phorcys, father of many monsters, made his home. There Perseus came upon his three daughters, the Grii. These were gray-haired from birth and had between them only one eye and one tooth, which they took turns in using. Perseus robbed them of both, and when they pleaded with him to return their priceless property, he consented on one condition, that they show him the way to the nymphs. These nymphs were magical beings with certain prized possessions, a pair of winged shoes, a wallet, and a helmet of doghide. Whoever wore these things could fly wherever he wished and see whom he would without being seen himself. The daughters of Forces pointed out the road which led to the home of the nymphs and so recovered their eye and tooth. From the nymphs Perseus found out what he wanted and seized the wallet, throwing it over his shoulder, the winged sandals, which he bound to his feet, and the helmet, which he set on his head. Hermes lent him a brazen shield, and furnished with all these aids he flew toward the ocean where the Gorgons, the three other daughters of Forces, lived. Only the third, who was called the Medusa, was mortal, and that was why Perseus had been sent to cut off her head. He found the Gorgons asleep. Instead of skin, they had dragon scales. Instead of hair, snakes twined their brows. Their teeth were like the tusks of a boar, and they had hands of metal and golden wings which could cleave the air. Perseus knew that anyone who looked at them would instantly be turned to stone, so he stood with his back to the sleepers, caught their triple image in his shining shield, and singled out the Medusa. Athene guided his hand, and he cut off the monster's head without mishap. Scarcely had he done this, when a winged horse, Pegasus, sprang from her trunk, and after it the giant Chrysor, both of them the children of Poseidon. Perseus hid the Medusa's head in his wallet and moved off again, walking backwards in the same manner as he had approached. But now the sisters of the Medusa awoke and left their couch. Their glance fell on the body of their slain sister, and instantly they rose into the air in pursuit of the slayer. The helmet of the nymphs, however, made Perseus invisible, and they could not discover him. As he flew above the earth, the winds tossed him hither and thither like a rain cloud and shook his wallet, so that the Medusa's head oozed drops of blood which fell upon the sandy waste of Libya and changed to many colored serpents. Ever since, Libya has been infested with poisonous vipers and adders. Then Perseus flew westward and floated down to earth in the realm of King Atlas to rest. This king had a grove of trees bearing golden fruits, over which he had set a mighty dragon as guard. In vain did the conqueror of the Gorgon ask shelter for the night. Atlas feared for his treasure and drove him from the palace. This angered Perseus, and he said, Since you refuse to grant me what I ask, it is I who shall grant you a gift. And with that he drew the Medusa's head from his wallet, turned aside, and held it out to the king, 
who was at once turned to stone, or rather, because of his gigantic stature, to a mountain. His beard and hair became spreading forests. His shoulders, hands, and bones stiffened to rocky ledges, and his head changed into a peak which loomed into the clouds. And now again Perseus bound the winged sandals to his feet. He strapped the wallet to his side, put the helmet on his head, and leaped into the air. On his travels he came to the coast of Ethiopia, where King Cepheus held sway. Here he saw a girl chained to a cliff which jetted into the sea. Had her hair not blown in the wind and the tears trembled in her eyes, he would have taken her for a statue carved of marble. In his delight at her loveliness, he almost forgot to move his wings. Tell me, he implored her, why you, who should be decked out in shimmering jewels, are bound with chains? Tell me the name of your country. Tell me your own name. At first she was silent and shy, afraid to speak to a stranger. Had she been able to move, she would have covered her face with her hands. But so the youth might not believe she had some guilt to conceal, she answered at last. I am Andromeda, the daughter of Cepheus, king of Ethiopia. My mother boasted to the sea nymphs, who are the daughters of Nereus, that she was more beautiful than they. This made the Nereids angry, and their friend, the sea god, churned up a flood which swept across the land. With it came a monster, devouring whatever crossed his path. An oracle promised liberation from this plague provided I, the king's daughter, were thrown to the beast for food. My father's people pressed him to save them, and in despair he had me fettered to this cliff. She had hardly finished when the waves parted with a rushing noise, and from the depths of the ocean rose a monster whose broad breast stretched over the surface of the waters. The girl screamed with terror, and her parents hastened toward her, frantic with grief, her mother's sorrow doubled by her sense of guilt. They embraced their daughter, but could think of nothing to do but weep and lament. Then Perseus spoke, There is always time enough for tears, but the hour to act passes swiftly. I am Perseus, son of Zeus and Danae. Magic wings carry me through the air, and the Medusa fell by my sword. Even if this girl were free and had her choice among many suitors, I should make no mean husband for her. Yet I woo her now, as she is, and offer to save her. Who could have hesitated under such circumstances? The happy parents promised him not only their daughter, but their own kingdom as her dowry. While they were still intent on questioning each other, the monster approached like a ship with the wind full in her sails, and was soon only a stone's throw from the cliff. Then the youth took off from land, thrusting against it with his foot, and bounded into the upper air. The beast saw his shadow on the sea, and made for it with furious speed, scenting an enemy who threatened to cheat it of its prey. Perseus darted from the sky like an eagle, landed on the animal's back, and plunged the weapon with which he had killed the Medusa into its body just below the neck, up to the very hilt. Hardly had he drawn forth the blade, when the scaly thing now leaped high into the air, now dived deep into the tide, and there raged in all directions like a boar pursued by the pack. Perseus struck at it again and again until the black blood gushed from its throat. But his wings were dripping, and he no longer dared trust to his waterlogged plumage. Fortunately, he espied a reef whose highest point projected from the waves. With his left hand, he supported himself on this slender pinnacle, while his right drove the blade twice, three, four times, into the monster's bowels. The current carried the vast body away, and soon it vanished from the face of the deep. Perseus had sprung ashore. He climbed the cliff and loosed the bonds of the girl, who welcomed him with a look of gratitude and love. He brought her to her rejoicing parents, and the golden palace flung its gates wide for the bridegroom. The wedding feast was still steaming on the board, and the hours sped nimbly by in carefree happiness, when the court suddenly filled with a muttering throng. Phineas, the brother of King Cepheus, who had wooed his niece Andromeda but abandoned her in her need, had come to renew his claims, supported by a host of armed men. 
Brandishing his spear, he entered the wedding hall and cried out to Perseus, who listened in amazement, I have come to avenge the theft of my promised bride. Neither your wings nor Zeus, your father, will help you escape me. And even as he spoke he aimed his spear. Then Cepheus rose and called to his brother. You are mad, he said. What is driving you to this evil deed? It was not Perseus who robbed you of your beloved. You gave her up when we were forced to consent to her death, and you stood by while she was being bound and failed to offer aid either as her uncle or her lover. Why did you not carry off the prize from the cliff yourself? The least you can do now is leave her to him who has won her fairly and comforted my old age by preserving my daughter for me. Phineas did not deign to reply. He shot angry glances, now at his brother, now at his rival, as if weighing in his mind which of the two should be his first victim. After that instant of hesitation, however, he hurled his spear at Perseus with a force doubled by rage. But he missed, and the weapon buried its point in a cushion on one of the couches. And now Perseus leaped up and flung his javelin toward the door through which Phineas had entered, and it would have pierced his breast had he not saved himself by darting behind the altar. As it was, the weapon struck the forehead of one of his companions, and now his entire retinue pressed forward and engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with the wedding guests, so rudely startled from the banquet. They strove hard and long, but the intruders outstripped the guests in numbers, and at last Perseus found himself surrounded by Phineas and his warriors. Arrows whirred through the air like hailstones in a storm. Perseus covered his back by standing up against a column and from this point of vantage turned upon his foes, checked their forward surge, and slew one after another. But there were too many of them, and only when he realized that valor alone would not avail him here did he resort to the last sure means at his disposal. Since you force me to it, he cried, my old enemy shall help me. Let whatever friend I have here turn his head away. With this he drew the Medusa's head from the wallet he always wore slung across his shoulder and held it up to the nearest assailant. The man cast a rapid glance at the object before him and laughed in derision. Go, find someone else to impress with your miracles, he shouted. But even as he lifted his hand to throw the javelin, he turned to stone, his hand still raised in midair. And the same thing happened to one after another. When only two hundred were left, Perseus held the head of the Medusa so high that all could see it at once, and the whole two hundred stopped in their tracks and became rock. Not until then did Phineas feel a qualm at his unrighteous warfare. Right and left he saw nothing but statues, and when he called to his friends, no one answered. He touched the flesh of those nearest him with unbelieving fingers, but it had turned to marble. Then at last he succumbed to terror, and his defiance changed to confusion. Only leave me my life, he pleaded. The bride and the realm shall be yours. But in his sadness at the death of his new friends, Perseus was implacable. Traitor, he replied, I shall found an enduring monument to you in the house of my parents-in-law, and though Phineas tried to evade it, he was forced to look upon that awful head. The tears in his eyes stiffened to stone, and there he stood with cowardly mien, arms hanging at his sides, and the humble attitude of a servant. And now Perseus could take home his beloved Andromeda. Long, radiant days lay in store for him, and he even found his mother Danae again. But he could not escape being the tool which brought disaster to his grandfather Acrisius, who, for fear of the oracle, had fled to an alien land, to the king of the Pelasgians. Here he was attending athletic contests, held on a certain festival day, when Perseus, bound on a voyage to Argos, arrived on the scene. He took part in the games and by unlucky chance struck Acrisius with the discus. When he knew what he had done, and who it was he had killed, he deeply mourned the dead, buried his grandfather beyond the confines of the city, and bartered the kingdom he had inherited. And now envious fate stopped persecuting him. Andromeda bore him many beautiful sons, 
and in them their father's glory lived on. Creusa and Ion Erechthus, king of Athens, had a beautiful daughter named Creusa. Without her parents' knowledge, she had become the bride of Apollo and borne him a son home. For fear of her father's wrath, she hid in a basket and placed in the grotto where she and the sun god had so often met secretly. Her hope was that the immortals would have pity on the child. In order that the newborn boy might not be without some token of his identity, she put upon him a necklace linked of small golden dragons, which she had worn as a girl. Apollo, whose divine insight revealed to him the birth of his son, did not want to betray his beloved nor fail to help the boy, so he turned to his brother Hermes, the messenger of the gods, for, since he was a go-between familiar to both heaven and earth, he could walk among men without attracting undue attention. Dear brother, said Phoebus, a mortal, the daughter of the king of Athens, has borne me a child and, for fear of her father, has hidden it in a grotto. Help me rescue my son. Take him to my oracle at Delphi in the basket in which you will find him, and with the linen in which he is wrapped, and lay him down on the threshold of the temple. The rest you may leave to me, for he is my own child, and I shall see to him. And Hermes, the winged god, sped to Athens, found the boy in the hiding place Apollo had described, and carried him to Delphi in the basket woven of willow whites. There he set it down at the gates of the temple and raised the lid a little, so that the child might be seen easily. This he did by night. The next morning at sunrise, when the Delphic priestess moved toward the temple, her eyes fell on the infant asleep in the basket. She took it for the child of some inner do well and was about to thrust it away from the sacred threshold when the god filled her spirit with compassion for his son. So she lifted him tenderly and reared him herself, and the boy played about his father's altar and knew nothing of his parents. He grew tall and handsome, and the inhabitants of Delphi, who had become accustomed to seeing in him a little guardian of the temple, now put him in charge of the precious offerings made to the god. He lived an honorable and dedicated life in the precincts of Phoebus Apollo. In all these years, Creusa had heard nothing from her divine husband and could not help thinking he had forgotten both her and her son. About this time, the Athenians began to wage a fierce war with the people of the neighboring island of Euboea, and in the end the Euboeans were defeated, largely because a certain stranger from Achaea brought particularly effective aid to the Athenians. It was Zeuthus, a son of Aeolus, who was himself a son of Zeus. In return for his assistance he asked, and was granted, Creusa's hand in marriage. But it seemed as though the sun god took revenge on his beloved for marrying another, for she did not conceive, but lived childless. After a number of years, it occurred to her to go to the oracle of Delphi and pray for the fertility of her womb. This was just what Apollo wanted. The princess and her husband, accompanied by a small retinue of servants, set out for Delphi. At the very moment they reached the temple, the son of Apollo crossed the threshold to sweep the court with laurel twigs, according to the custom. His glance rested on the woman of noble bearing who came toward the temple, weeping at sight of the sanctuary. Struck by her air of majesty, he ventured to ask the cause of her sorrow. I do not wonder, she answered with a sigh, that my sadness drew your attention to me. For the fate I mourn may well be visible in my face. It is not my wish to intrude upon your grief, said the boy. But, if you will, tell me who you are and from whence you have come. I am Creusa, the princess replied. My father's name is Erechtheus, and Athens is my native land. In eager excitement, the boy cried out, What a glorious land! How famous the family from which you are descended! Is it true, what we have seen pictured, that your father's grandfather Erichthonius came up out of the earth like a young tree? That the goddess Athene placed the earthborn child in a chest, with two dragons to guard it, and brought it for safekeeping to the daughters of Cecrops? And that these could not check their curiosity, opened the chest and, beholding the boy, were stricken with madness, so that they hurled themselves to their death from the rocks of the citadel? 
Kriuza nodded silently, for the story of her ancestors had reminded her of the fate of her lost son. But he, standing before her, continued his guileless questioning. And tell me, noble princess, he asked, is it also true that in obedience to an oracle your father Erechthus sacrificed his daughters, your sisters, with their full consent, in order to overcome his foes? And if so, how is it that you alone escaped death? I was only just born, said Creusa. I lay in my mother's arms. And did the earth split and devour your father Erechthus? persisted the boy. Did Poseidon really destroy him with his trident, and is his grave near a grotto dear to Pythian Apollo, whom I serve? O stranger, speak not of that grotto. Creusa interrupted him with mournful agitation. It was the scene of a breach of faith and a great wrong. For a while she was silent, then she collected herself and told the youth, in whom she saw only the guard of the temple, that she was the wife of Prince Zuthus and had come to Delphi with him to implore the god to grant her sons. Phoebus Apollo, she said with a sigh, knows the cause of my childlessness. He alone can help me. So you have no children? The youth asked her sadly. None, said Creusa. And I envy your mother so fair a son. I know nothing of my mother, nor of my father, the boy answered dejectedly. I never lay at my mother's breast, nor do I know how I came here. All that my foster mother, the priestess of this temple, told me is that she took pity upon me once and brought me up. As far back as I can remember, the house of the god has been my dwelling. I am his servant. As she listened, the princess grew thoughtful, but her thoughts were vague and did not take definite shape. I know a woman whose fate is very like your mother's, she said. It is for her sake I have come to consult the oracle, and I shall confide her secret to you, who are the god's servant, before her husband arrives. He accompanied her upon this journey, but stopped on the way to hear the oracle of Trophonius. This woman claims that she was the wife of Phoebus Apollo before she married the man who is now her husband, and that she bore the god a child. This son she exposed in a certain place, and ever since that time she has not known whether he is alive or dead. On this my friend's behalf I have come to ask whether her son yet lives or is long since dead. How long ago was all this? asked the youth. If the child lived, said Creusa, he would be of your age. Oh, how like my own is the destiny of your friend, cried the youth sorrowfully. She is looking for her son, and I seek my mother. But what happened to her took place in a far-off land, and we are strangers to each other. Do not hope, however, that the god will give you the answer you desire. For in your friend's name you have come to accuse him of faithlessness, and he will not wish to pronounce judgment upon himself. Stop, said Creusa. There comes the husband of the woman I was speaking of. Try to forget what I have told you, perhaps too readily and openly. Zuthus advanced joyfully toward his wife. Creusa, he called out to her, Trophonius has given me happy tidings. I shall not leave this place without a child. But who is this with you? Who is this youthful priest? The boy modestly approached the prince and told him that he was only Apollo's servant, that the noblest among the men of Delphi, chosen by lot, were in the innermost sanctuary, seated around the tripod from which the priestess was preparing to issue the oracle. When the prince heard this, he bade Creusa adorn herself with the sprays which suppliants must carry, and implore a favorable answer from Apollo at the god's altar, which stood in the open under the sky and was wreathed about with branches of laurel. He himself hastened to the shrine within, while the boy remained on guard in the outer court. Before long he heard the doors open and close with a sound like thunder. Then he saw Zuthus hurrying forth with an air of happy bewilderment. Impetuously he flung his arms about the boy, called him son over and over, and begged him to clasp him in return and kiss him with filial devotion, until the young servant of Apollo thought the old man must be out of his mind and thrust him aside with youthful strength. 
But Zuthus would not accept such denial. The god himself revealed this to me, he insisted. The oracle issue to me was that the first person I met outside should be my son, a gift of the immortals. How this can be I do not know, for my wife has never borne me a child. But I trust in the god. If and when he will, let him lay bare the secret. And now the boy too gave up his reserve and yielded himself up to happiness. But not utterly, for even as he kissed and embraced his father he sighed, O oh, darling mother, where are you? When may I look on your dear face? He was, moreover, in grave doubt as to what the childless wife of Zuthus, whom, so he thought, he had never seen, would say to this unexpected stepson, and how the city of Athens would receive one who was not his father's legitimate heir. But Zuthus bade him be of good courage, promising to present him to his wife and to his people, not as his son, but as a stranger. He then gave him the name of Ion, the Pacer, because he had clasped him to his breast as his son while the boy paced the court of the temple. Creusa, in the meantime, had not stirred from Apollo's altar, at which she had prostrated herself in prayer. But her earnest supplication was interrupted by her servants, who came to her lamenting loudly. Unhappy mistress, they called out to her, Your husband rejoices, but you will never hold a child in your arms or suckle it at your breast. Apollo has granted him a son, a son full-grown, who was probably born to him years ago by heaven knows what concubine. He came to meet Zuthus as he was coming from the temple. And now the father will delight in the son he has recovered while you will live in your empty house like a widow. The poor princess, whose spirit the gods must have struck with blindness, since she did not solve so transparent a secret, brooded over her sad fate in silence. After a little she inquired after the name and person of this stepson she seemed to have acquired. He is the young guard of the temple, the one you spoke with, her servants replied. His father has named him Ion. We do not know who his mother is. And now your husband has gone to the altar of Dionysus to make secret sacrifice for his son. Later there will be a solemn banquet. He threatened us with death if we told you these things, and only the love we bear you compels us to disobey him. But do not betray us to him. And now an old servant, who was completely loyal to the house of Erechtheus and loved his mistress with deep devotion, separated himself from the rest and began to rail against Prince Zuthus, calling him a faithless adulterer. In his passionate zeal, he even offered to do away with this bastard son, who would otherwise unlawfully acquire the heritage of the Erechthides. Creusa thought herself deserted both by her husband and her lover of long ago. Confused with sorrow and hopelessness, she agreed to the evil plans of the old man and, in return, confided to him her relationship to the god. When Zuthus left the temple with Ion, he took him to the double peak of Mount Parnassus, where the people of Delphi used to worship Dionysus, whom they held no less sacred than Apollo himself and celebrated with wild orgies. After the prince had poured a libation in gratitude for his son, the boy, with the help of the servants who had accompanied him, set up a large and magnificent tent under the open sky and covered it with tapestries finely woven, which he had bidden them bring from the temple of Apollo. Long tables were placed within, and on them silver platters heaped with rich and dainty foods, and golden cups of fragrant wine. Then Zuthus sent his herald down to the city of Delphi and invited all its inhabitants to share in his joy. Soon the great tent was filled with guests whose heads were garlanded with wreaths. They dined in gaiety and splendor, and when the dessert was served, an aged man, whose curious gestures amused the guests, came out into their midst and took upon himself the office of cupbearer. Zuthus recognized him as Creusa's old servant, praised his industry and faithfulness, and, for the rest, let him do as he pleased. So he went to the board which held the wines and saw to the cups and the needs of the guests. Toward the end of the banquet, when the flutes were beginning to play, he bade the serving boys take the small cups from the festal board and set large vessels of gold and silver before the guests. 
he himself took the most beautiful of all and filled it to the brim with the noblest wine, as if to honor his new young lord, but secretly he added a deadly poison. As he approached Ion and poured a few drops on the ground as a libation, a servant who stood close by inadvertently uttered a curse. Ion, who had grown up among the sacred rites of the temple, knew this for an evil omen, emptied all the wine, and asked for a fresh draft from another cup, from which he himself solemnly poured the libation. All the guests followed his example. Just then a flock of holy doves, bred and fed in the temple of Apollo, under the god's protection, fluttered into the tent, and when they saw the streams of wine flowing on all sides, greedily alighted and began to sip with thrust-out bills. And none was harmed save one which settled where Ion had emptied his first cup. Hardly had she wetted her bill when she began to beat her wings and reel about, until at last she died in spasms of pain, while the guests looked on in amazement. At this Ion rose from his seat, angrily shook his arms free of his robe, clenched his fists, and cried, Who is it that wanted to kill me? Speak, old man, for it was you who lent your aid. You blended the draft and handed me the cup. And he gripped the servant's shoulder and would not release him. Taken off his guard and alarmed, he confessed his crime but shifted all the blame to Creusa. Then Ion, whom Apollo's oracle had declared son of Zeuthus, left the tent and all crowded after him in wild confusion. Under the open sky, within a circle of the noblest Delphians, he lifted his hands and said, Holy Earth, you are witness that this alien woman of the line of the Erectides wanted to kill me with poison. Stone her, stone her, clamored the people as if with a single voice, and they followed Ion in search of Creusa. Zeuthus himself was swept away with the rest, hardly aware of what he was about, for the dreadful discovery had dulled his reason. Creusa was awaiting the outcome of her desperate attempt at Apollo's altar. But it was quite other from what she expected. A gust of sound from far off roused her from her lonely brooding, and as it swelled and came nearer, one of her husband's serving men, who was loyal to her above all others, ran in the van of the surging mob to tell her that her plot had been discovered and that the people of Delphi were resolved to kill her. Hold fast to the altar, her women counseled, pressing about her, and if this holy place does not save you from your murderers, they will, at least, incur blood guilt which no penance can atone for. In the meantime, the furious Delphians, led by Ion, came closer and closer, and even before they reached the temple, the boy's angry words were carried to her by the wind. The gods have favored me, he cried. For this crime, which was never accomplished, was intended to free me of a hostile stepmother. Where is she? Where is that viper with poisonous fangs, that she-dragon with eyes flashing flames of death? Let us hurl the murderers from the highest cliff. And the throngs around him howled their applause. They reached the altar, and Ion seized the woman who was his mother, but who seemed to him his deadly foe, and tried to drag her from the sanctuary whose holiness she had invoked to save herself. But Apollo did not wish the son to murder his mother. His divine will carried the news of Creusa's attempted crime and of the punishment to be meted out to her to the ears of his priestess and illumined her spirit, so that she suddenly grasped the meaning in all that had happened and knew that her foster child Ion was not the son of Zeuthus, as she herself had declared in ambiguous prophecy, but of Apollo and Creusa. She left her tripod and fetched forth the basket in which the newborn babe, together with certain tokens she had carefully preserved, had once been found at the gates of the temple at Delphi. With these in her hands, she hastened to the altar where Creusa was struggling with Ion for her very life. When Ion saw the priestess, he at once loosened his hold and advanced toward her reverently. Welcome, dear mother, he said, for so I must call you, although you did not give birth to me. Have you heard what wicked designs I have just escaped? Scarcely had I found a father when my evil stepmother planned my destruction. Now tell me what to do, and I will obey your command. 
The priestess lifted a warning finger and said, Ion, start for Athens with unstained hands and under favorable auspices. Ion thought for a moment and then countered, Is he not stainless who kills his foes? Do not kill until you have heard me, said the priestess in majesty. Do you see this basket in my hands? And the fresh garlands I have twined around the old wives? In this you were once exposed, from this I took you and reared you. Ion looked at her in astonishment. You never told me anything of this, mother, he said. Why have you kept this secret so long? Because the God wanted you to serve him all these years, she answered. Now that he has given you a father, he has freed you to go to Athens. But how is this basket to help me? asked Dion. It contains the linen in which you were wrapped, dear son, said the priestess. Linen? exclaimed Dion. Why, that is a token which may lead me to my rightful mother. The priestess held out the basket to him, and he eagerly thrust his hand into it and drew out the folded linen. While his eyes, dim with tears, rested on this treasured keepsake, Creusa had gradually regained her composure. A glance at the basket discovered the whole truth to her. She rushed from the altar, and with a single jubilant word, son, clasped Ion in her arms. With renewed suspicion he tried to free himself from her embraces, thinking that this was only another ruse. But Creusa herself released him and stepping back said, This linen shall testify to the truth of my words. Do not hesitate to undo the folds. You will find the tokens I shall describe to you. The embroidery which adorns them I myself stitched long ago, when I was a girl. In the middle of the stuff you will see the gorgon's head, ringed with serpents, as it appears on the shield of Athene. Dubiously Ion unfolded the linen, but suddenly he cried out joyfully, O oh, mighty Zeus, here is the Medusa, and these are the serpents. It is not enough, said Creusa. There must be a necklace of small dragons, wrought of gold, and memory of the dragons in the chest of Erichthonius. Ion searched the basket and, smiling in delight, drew out the necklace. And the last token, said Creusa, is a wreath of unfading olive leaves which I set on the head of my newborn son. They come from the first olive tree planted in Athens. Ion put his hand into the bottom of the basket and lifted out a fresh green olive wreath. Mother, mother, he cried in a voice broken with sobs, flung his arms around Creusa, and covered her face with kisses. At last he tore himself away and asked about Zuthus, his father. Then Creusa told him the secret of his birth, that he was the son of the god in whose temple he had served so long and faithfully. Now he understood the mystery of those early events and Creusa's mistake and was glad to pardon her designs upon one she did not know. Zuthus embraced Ion, whom he accepted as a stepson and a cherished gift of the gods, and all three went into the temple to give thanks to Apollo. Seated at her tripod, the priestess prophesied that Ion would be the father of a glorious race, to be named Ionians, in honor of him. And to Zuthus she prophesied that Creusa would bear him a son, Darus, who would father the Dorians, famed throughout the world. Rejoicing in fulfillment and hope, Zuthus and Creusa set out for Athens with the son who had been restored to her, and all the people of Delphi came to speed them on their way.